Welcome to Worship Online from Bath United Methodist Church in Bath, Maine. I'm Gwyneth Arison, pastor of this awesome congregation. And though we are separated by miles and perhaps listening to this recording at different times, through the Holy Spirit, we are together, worshiping Jesus who is our rock and our salvation and ever-present help in time of need. I want to offer a special welcome today to our sisters and brothers from the Pleasant Street United Methodist Church in Waterville, Maine, who are joining us for worship today and are assisting with some of the music and readings. We are going to prepare for worship now by lighting a candle, which reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. You may want to set up a candle to light in your space as well. Let's prepare our hearts for worship now. This is the call to worship from Ephesians chapter 2. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We worship Christ who came and proclaimed peace to you and who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we all have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you who are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also the members of the household of God. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as our cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grown, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Christ alone we are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. We worship Him now. Oh, 
from folks this week so I thought I'd take this chance to show you some video clips of our weekly drive through dinner church. This past week we served 72 meals which was a new record and it's likely with the state of our economy that we will need to continue this ministry for some time. So here's a little glimpse of what we do each week. In the fall of 2019, the Bath United Methodist Church in Bath, Maine began hosting a free monthly community dinner, which included music and prayer, a short scripture reading and discussion around tables. In March 2020, when we were hit by the coronavirus, we realized that food insecurity would likely increase rapidly. So instead of canceling our monthly community dinners, we shifted gears to provide a drive-through homemade meal every week. The first week we served a little under 20 meals. The numbers increased just about every week, leveling out at a little over 60 meals per week by the end of April. And by the end of the June, we were serving over 70 meals. A lot of preparation goes into these meals and we're very grateful to have a large commercial grade kitchen at our church, as well as generous donations for this ministry to keep it going. In addition to a, a main course, which is usually a hot casserole or soup, there is a side such as fresh baked biscuits, and we receive individually wrapped baked goods from church folks each week to give out with the meals as well. Here's the dinner set up inside, and we put little uh, brochures in each of the bags with the meals to go. This week is a simpler meal. What is it, Diane? It is ham and potato salad, a nice cool summer meal. Awesome. With dessert. We have a great system worked out with two meal preparers inside and one greeter outside taking orders as cars pull up around the circle. While the meals are being packed, the greeter checks in with the customer offers prayer, and brings any needed grocery items over. The main goal of this ministry is to help people get healthy meals during this difficult time. We also want to help people's spiritual health. So we always check in with people to see how they're doing, ask if they have any prayer requests, and pray with them if they would like. We also have on hand some staples that we are able to give out, including uh, toilet paper and paper towels. Each week, these items are set up outside. We include a short newsletter with each meal with ways people may want to connect through worship, prayer, or study. 
And on special days, we often provide a gift of some sort. For instance, for Mother's Day, we handed out chocolate flowers. Our fresh produce is donated each week from local farms through Merry Meeting Gleaners. We receive whatever has just been picked, such as lettuce and cabbage, potatoes, sweet potatoes, onions, radishes, carrots, garlic, and microgreens. We've been giving out face masks as fast as Barbara Word can sew them, which people have so much appreciated. That color okay? That's fine. Uh, flower ones too, if you'd rather have a paisley. Surprise me. <laughs> In addition to drive through we deliver about 30 meals around Bath to apartments and homes. The bags are labeled and packed into the car and then driven around town by a few different people each week. We've received several thank you cards for our ministry. We plan to continue our drive through dinner church as long as it's needed. We invite you to stop by to see the ministry in action any Wednesday and give a big shout out to all the folks who bake and set up, cook and greet, pack and deliver. The Bible reading for today comes from Acts 4, verses 1 through 12. Talks about when Peter and John were arrested. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they had taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid their hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of men came to be about 5,000. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, uh, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name? Have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means has he been made well? Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone by which he was rejected by your builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there any salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. They saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus and seeing a man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's now lift up our prayers before God and one another. After each joy or concern, we will all agree together. Lord, hear our prayer from wherever we are. I praise God for the Pleasant Street United Methodist Church in Waterville participating in worship today. Uh, for Molly uh, Gluick singing and Eric Leimbach reading and I lift up prayers for their pastor, Tom Blackstone, as he returns from vacation. Lord, hear our prayer. I lift up prayers for United Methodist churches across New England, including ours, that shift districts this week. Bath the UMC will be part of the new Katahdin district as of July 1st. So we also lift up prayers for our new district superintendent, Jackie Brannon and 
for her secretary, Kelly Santiago, and for all of the churches who will be shifting into this new district. Lord, hear our prayer. Julie Ramsey, our church secretary, is back from Ohio. I lift up praise that she had the chance to visit with her family for several weeks, and a praise that she's back now to help get the church office back in order from the chaos of her absence. Lord, hear our prayer. If you are on our email list, you know that we have been praying this week for Morris Dauphin, who had a heart attack last weekend and went through bypass surgery on Wednesday. We lift up prayers for what is expected to be a couple months of recovery and for Kathy while he remains in the hospital for at least another week. Lord, hear our prayer. We have also been praying for Kathy Smith who fell down the stairs and broke her ankle and did some serious damage to ligaments that required surgery on Thursday. She also is looking at many weeks of recovery. Um, if you can help with meals for her and Ralph, please contact the church. Lord, hear our prayer. Karen Valentine lifts up her co-worker John and his 11-year-old son Joshua who had surgery Wednesday to attach electrodes to monitor activity and is scheduled for another surgery on July 1st. Lord, hear our prayer. I lift up continued prayers for those in hospitals and other facilities caring for those with COVID-19, for those out of work due to COVID-19 and continued prayers for those struggling for survival and for the family who longs to be by their side, and for those who are isolated due to COVID, and those most vulnerable, especially in areas such as Florida, that have once again become hotspots of infection. Lord, hear our prayer. I lift up continued prayers for all my black friends, clergy colleagues, and others, and for an end to oppression of black people in our nation and for all of us to find ways to affirm and listen and love and to bring God's justice and love in our country. Lord, hear our prayer. And I lift up prayers for our increasingly divided country and that we as churches can find ways of building bridges and bringing peace that our nation so desperately needs. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all the unspoken prayers, Lord, hear our prayer. Jesus, we praise you, our risen Lord, our rock and our salvation in whom we trust as the foundation for all we do and for all you've called us to be. We offer you our praises as those called out of darkness into your wonderful light. And we offer you our concerns that we might trust in your love and provision. We know God that you are loving and your plan is good. So we ask that you would help us to trust you in the days and weeks ahead, both in our joy and in our concern, in our fear and in our celebration. Draw us near to you, Lord, and to one another as we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, and it comes from The Message by Eugene Peterson. Welcome to the living stone, the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out. God set it in the place of honor. Present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life, in which you'll serve as holy priests offering Christ-approved lives up to God. The scriptures provide precedent. Look, I'm setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never have cause to regret it. To you who trust him, he's a stone to be proud of. But to those who refuse to trust him, the stone the workmen threw out is now the chief foundation stone. For the untrusting, it's a stone to trip over, a boulder blocking the way. They trip and fall because they refuse to obey, just as predicted. But you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Two weeks ago, we began a sermon series on 1 Peter and what it means to be the church. The Apostle Peter is writing to churches in what is present-day Turkey, and this is the first of two letters that were widely circulated in the late first century. So Peter starts off his letter talking about the trials that the early church is experiencing, trials like a fiery furnace, which, although painful, serve to refine and perfect our faith. And then last week, we talked about the section of the letter where Peter moves into the church's call to witness to God's faithfulness, even in the midst of such trials. This week, we learn what Peter means by the church's call to be living stones in God's temple. This is Dina when she was little, but all three of my kids grew up building with Legos and blocks. When it was a tower or building, each of them always started with the foundation and actually with one block or Lego. All the others were set in reference to this first one. How tall a building could be built depended on how stable that foundation was. When the Jewish temple, the second Jewish temple, was built in Jerusalem some 500 years before the birth of Jesus, Likewise, there was a first stone, and all other stones were set in reference to this stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. That first stone is called the cornerstone and is the most important stone in the building. Here's an example of a very large cornerstone which weighs about 80 tons, that's 160,000 pounds, the cornerstone provides the foundation for the walls of the structure. Without a, a good foundation, the building will be unstable and likely fail. So the builders would need to find the best, the strongest, the perfect shape and type of rock for the cornerstone. And the builders would search and search, rejecting many stones in order to find that perfect one. And we can imagine that sometimes the builders would reject a stone that would have been perfect, but they didn't realize it. In our scripture, we are invited to come to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by the people, meaning the religious leaders, but he is precious to God who chose him. Christ is the spiritual cornerstone on which our faith is built. Everything we believe, all that we are and do as followers of Christ is set in reference to Christ, who is our living cornerstone. Not only that, but Christ, our living cornerstone, is the foundation on which our entire faith is built. If we build on anything else, our faith will likely crumble and fall with the first trauma we might experience. But the reality is, 
we do choose different foundations. And so the scripture says that God's people rejected Christ. The religious leaders crucified him because the type of cornerstone they wanted was large and powerful. They were interested in power and control and wealth and security. Rather than face their fear of changing long-held traditions and losing their power, the religious leaders had Christ executed. But as our scripture says, though the people rejected Christ, God chose him, which is why Christ is the living cornerstone, because God raised him from the dead, and he is alive today and invites us to experience the same life in his name. But it's still tempting to build our spiritual foundation on things other than Christ, such as good works. Good works are, well, good. But they're meant to be a response of gratitude for Christ accepting us, not what causes us to be accepted by Christ. And there are all kinds of things we can put before Christ, trying to make them cornerstones of our life. One common pitfall is making family members the cornerstone of our life. Family is a wonderful gift from God, but if they become the foundation of our lives, it will either result in their not being able to live up to our impossible expectations or our living in constant fear of losing them. Only Christ is the sure foundation and will not disappoint us and will never leave us and never forsake us. Nevertheless, we choose other foundations for our lives and reject Christ. I myself am one who spent half my life rejecting Christ. Religion was a crutch for weak-minded individuals. But in my mid-twenties, a crisis brought me to seek God or at least question his existence. And through a disciple Bible study, the same one I'm leading with quite a large group online right now, I experienced myself as being precious to God. Not for anything I did or didn't do, but just for who I was. And so I gave up my fight against God and came to Christ, who became the cornerstone of my life. Is Christ the cornerstone of your life? We're invited, come to Christ, who is the living cornerstone. Now, once the foundation is laid, the real building process begins. The walls, the windows, doorways, porches, stairways, roof. Just yesterday, I was introduced to someone and when they heard where I was pastor, she said, oh, that's the new church up on Oak Grove. I wanted to respond, yes, the brand new church built in 2006 with a very young new pastor. <laughs> well, many of you saw the new church building going up in 2006 firsthand, and much of the upstairs is still unfinished, and the sanctuary was never added. But Peter isn't talking about church building construction. The church is not a building. It's us who are the building. And God is in the building process. We are that building. It may be hard to think of yourself as part of a building. But imagine yourself as a living stone in God's building. A precious stone to God. Peter writes, and now God is building you as living stones into his spiritual temple. Each of us who have come to Christ, the living cornerstone, are being built into God's spiritual temple as living stones. Now notice that the invitation is plural, stones. Yes, each of us comes to Christ individually, but our call is to be built together into a community. Some folks will say, oh, they don't come to church because they can have their relationship, just me and God. That's not much of a building though, is it? It's not much use, one stone lying on top of a cornerstone. It's only together in community Many stones built together that our faith has significant meaning. That's why as frustrating as the church can be, we still find ourselves strangely drawn to be part of a church family. In one of my previous congregations, there was a lady who hadn't gone to church in years. Something had happened, who, who knows what it was, but she left and was gone for years. Well, this church was hosting a free community carnival one weekend. This lady happened to stop by, and someone invited her to come to worship the next day. She wasn't Methodist, but decided to give it a try. She told me several years later that this was a turning point in her life. When she attended that first worship gathering, she realized how empty her life had become. How, even though she still believed in God, how her life seemed to lack meaning. But when she visited our church, she felt like she was home after being away for a very long time. 
That's what the church family is, home. It's where we experience a sense of belonging to God and belonging to one another as siblings in Christ, where we're built up in the faith together. This is a, a unique challenge when we can't gather inside our building together right now, but this pandemic has proven to many of us that being built up together as God's church happens as we pray for one another, as we check in and care for one another, as we serve our community together, as we worship together online and learn together online, even if none of these can happen at a particular church facility. You know, I would, I would say our church is even stronger now than before the pandemic. And there isn't hardly a day that goes by. I don't talk to someone from our church who says something about how much our church family means to them. <laughs> how is God calling you to be further built up in the faith together with your church family? Now, stones don't do a whole lot, even in groups, do they? They just sit there. Even living stones might be alive, but it's hard to picture them as very active. But Christianity is not a spectator sport. And so the Apostle Peter moves on from using the image of living stones in a temple to the image of priests ministering in the temple. Peter says, not only are you living stones being built into God's spiritual temple, you are God's holy priests who offer the spiritual sacrifices that please him because of Jesus Christ. So next time someone asks you what you do for a living, say, I'm a priest. In the Jewish temple, only the priests could bring sacrifices for the people. But now as Christians, all of us are called to offer the spiritual sacrifices that please God. What sacrifices are you bringing to build up God's spiritual temple, the body of Christ? When we joined the United Methodist Church, we vowed to build up the body of Christ with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And the question isn't whether we're praying some, we're attending worship when we can, we're giving some money, serving occasionally, or sharing our faith every once in a while. The question is how much we are doing these things sacrificially. How much are we doing these things not in our own power, but in God's power? How often are we doing these things so we have to sacrifice something? You know, most of us pray for a few minutes each day, but how often have we taken a whole day, taken a day off work to pray? Or like Jesus, stayed up all night to pray? Or how many have fasted for a time to increase our passion in prayer? Most of us serve our church in some way. There are people looking after the building, leading Bible studies, serving meals at the drive through dinner church, sewing masks to give away, paying bills. Others may also serve outside the walls of the church at the food pantry or skate park. But what's the limit to our sacrificial service? How much are we actually willing to sacrifice if God called us to? I was confronted by this question when I went to Nicaragua on a mission trip with the United Methodist Church a few years ago. We traveled to some of the poorest, most remote regions of Nicaragua with a Christian mobile medical and dental clinic begun by our New England conference. A month before our trip, our mission team heard some terrible news. Uh, two brothers who were part of the mobile dental clinic had died in a motorcycle accident, one leaving a wife and two kids. When we were back in the city, we visited this wife, uh, Erica, and her children. She had apparently also been part of the traveling dental clinic with her husband, Alejandro, in recent months. In tears, she shared with us how she felt Christ's presence with her since the accident, and how she sensed his call to take over her husband's dental practice where he left off. She felt called to go to dental school and earn her medical degree, to bring the gospel message to the remote communities just as her husband had, and to bring education and dental health to these communities as well. She barely had enough money to take care of her children by herself, but still she felt called to sacrifice her life. On the way back to the United States, our mission team discussed how we might support her, and we decided that all of us together, giving $50 per month for three years, would put her through dental school. And she is now one of the mobile health clinic dentists. Her, sacrifici her sacrificial offering of her life inspired each one of us to be part of the beautiful work that God is building. 
all of us are like living stones being built into God's amazing work. And we are like priests serving sacrificially to draw more and more people to come to Christ. As we focus on the stones on the beach, I'd like you to consider now how God is calling you to respond to this message from the Apostle Peter. Is God calling you to make Christ the cornerstone of your life? Or perhaps to renew that commitment today? Is God calling you to renew your relationship with your church family? To allow yourself to be built up with others in the church? Maybe by joining a group Bible study or reaching out to individuals in the church family? Is God calling you to make or renew a commitment to serve as one of his priests, offering the sacrifice of your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. After worship today, I'd invite you to go outside if you can and find a stone, or maybe ask a grandchild or neighbor to find one for you, and to hold that stone in your hand to remind you of the commitment you are making with God today. And I invite you to keep that stone somewhere you are likely to see it so that this reminder might continue. Let's pray together. We praise you, our risen Lord, our living cornerstone in whom we trust as the foundation for all we do and all you've called us to be. Build us up into your beautiful spiritual temple together as your precious living stones. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord, who calls us to be one through the fiery love of the Holy Spirit. Amen. stones in the church that Christ is building so that the world might know that we are Christians by our love and want to be part of that amazing love. Amen.
Before you go, I have a few announcements for you. Next Sunday, July 5th, we are hosting our second Parking Lot Holy Communion service at 11.30 a.m. Here's a short video to show you what to expect. My name is Gwyneth Arison, and I am pastor of this absolutely amazing church, and you are proof of that right here. Families gathered for a brief service to prepare our hearts to receive Holy Communion. Parking attendants and helped to space cars apart, and everyone was overjoyed to see one another after so many months. After a short story, everyone sang a verse of Amazing Grace from their cars, and then the elements were consecrated. And he gave thanks. And he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It was a very different setting, but we felt the Holy Spirit's presence in this parking lot sanctuary. Then it was time for everyone to line up their cars to receive Holy Communion. So let's make our way over to the circle. Everybody can start your engines. Row by row, each car came up to the circle where they were served Holy Communion. The servers wore gloves and masks and to ensure minimum hand contact, each person in each car received a cup in which their communion elements were placed. It meant a lot for each person to receive the bread and cup from their pastor. After everyone had received, we gathered back in the parking lot for a closing prayer and song. For inviting us to your family table. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Hug your horns Hug your to your Jesus. <laughs> Worship can be viewed Sunday mornings on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page and is also broadcast on Bath TV Channel 14 and Brunswick TV Channel 3, so please share with your friends and family who don't have internet access. We're also meeting on Zoom for Coffee Fellowship each Sunday morning at 945 and then to view the recorded worship together, and all are welcome to join us. You can find the link on our webpage, bathumc.org. Care groups have been formed with a care captain assigned to each group to check in on you and your family. If you're not part of our regular worshiping community and would like to be placed in a care group, please contact the church office. We are hosting drive through dinner church every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Usually the to-go dinner consists of a hot casserole or soup, a side and dessert. We also have fresh produce, face masks, and other grocery items. You can pre-order by phoning the church, but it's not required, and we also deliver in bath upon request. We also invite you to consider all of the ministries of our church through this difficult time and know your offering makes a real difference. You may now safely donate online at bathumc.org give by credit card, bank number, or text. You may also mail your donation to 340 Oak Grove Avenue, Bath, Maine, 04530, and we thank you for your generosity.